Hello, everyone. Hi, and welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive into the code behind Cloud Native. I'm Itai Shakuri, and I'm director of open source at Aqua Security. I'm also a Cloud Native ambassador, and will be hosting today's show. So, Cloud Native Live. This is where we bring a new set of presenters every week to showcase how to work with Cloud Native technologies. They will build things and break things, and they will answer your questions uh, every week on Wednesdays. This week we have uh, Andy from Fairwinds um, to talk to us about Polaris and Gridlocks. Uh, before we get to that, um, just a quick reminder uh, that uh, KubeCon is coming up. It's going to be both an in-person and a virtual experience. So make sure to register in time. And now is the time. Uh, and another disclaimer that this is an official live stream of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. So please don't add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically, just please be respectful for, for your uh, fellow participants and uh, presenters. So um, hi, Andy. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi. Uh, I'm Andy. I'm a uh, director of R&D and technology at Fairwinds. Uh, Fairwinds is uh, got its start as a managed service provider in Kubernetes, and uh, we uh, took the learnings from those um, years of managing lots and lots of clusters, and we've we've built a lot of open source while we manage those clusters to solve a lot of the problems that we have. Um, and then on top of that, we built some SaaS, and so we just do all Kubernetes all the time, and uh, I get to tinker with all the fun stuff. Cool, and and you've open sourced some of the uh, tools that you've discovered along the way, I guess. Yeah, yeah. The two tools I'm gonna I'm gonna show today really were built out of a, a need for um, just some additional tooling to help us in our journey running Kubernetes for all of our different customers. So uh, Polaris really focuses on best practice configuration of your application workloads, and then Goldilocks came out of a need to help our clients set their resource requests and limits properly on all of their deployments uh, in their clusters. Yeah, that sounds very, both of them sounds very helpful. Um, how would you like to start this? Uh, would you like to start with one of them um, or how did you plan? Uh, so what I'd like to do, I kind of have, uh, what I've done today is I've set up a cluster. It's a pretty bare bones EKS cluster. And then I have installed an app on it. This is a, a demo app out there. It's a multi-tiered app uh, called Yelb uh, or YLB. I'm not actually sure how we're supposed to pronounce it, but essentially it's just a, a basic voting app. So uh, I uh, wrote a little loop over here in the console to just randomly vote. Uh, and so this app is running in my Kubernetes cluster. I got some YAML uh, for deploying it from, um, the repository that Yelp came from. It's very, very bare bones deployment. So we have um, just a few different pods running here. We've got a database, a Redis server, we've got a front end and a back end. And what I'd like to do today is uh, start with uh, Polaris and I'm gonna install Polaris in the cluster and look at the findings that it has uh, regarding this particular application. So kind of modeling, if I had just deployed a brand new application into my cluster, how could Polaris help me improve the security posture and the configuration of that? Um, right. So. Sounds good. And while we do that, I just want to remind everyone uh, that they can type questions in the chat. Uh, if you have anything, uh, just type it as you think about it, and I'll pick it up sometime and uh, maybe uh, bring it up. Great. All right, so um, in order to install Polaris, I'm just gonna use Helm. So uh, I've actually already installed it, but uh, I'm gonna show how to install it. Uh, so I'm gonna install Polaris in the namespace Polaris uh, from the Fairwinds stable Helm repository. Uh, and then if I were doing this from scratch, I might wanna add the create namespace flag just so that we get I've been doing too many other things today. Helm upgrade dash dash install. Uh, so this should install Polaris in our Polaris namespace within our cluster. And I'm gonna pop over here and use K9s because I really like the way it does port forwarding. Uh, so I'm in the Polaris namespace here. I'm gonna look for services in this namespace. I see that we have a dashboard 
Uh, in this namespace, so I'm going to port forward to this using K9s. Uh, so I'm just going to port forward to the dashboard on localhost 8080. And then I'm going to go up here into my browser, and we're going to take a look, look at what that looks like. Maybe. All right, let's make sure it's running, shall we? Take a look at the pods in the Polaris namespace. in the wrong order here. Oh, there's the problem. I can't spell localhost. Dangers of a live demo. All right. Localhost 8080, there we go. So we see the Polaris namespace, or the Polaris dashboard here. And uh, it's gonna give us just a rough score for our cluster. It's going to give us um, some uh, just numbers on how many checks we have passing, how many checks we have in the morning, how many checks we consider dangerous, uh, and then some basic information about the cluster. Um, and I'm really going to focus on the app namespace. So I've deployed the Yelp app into uh, the Yelp namespace. You can look through all of the different findings in Polaris, but uh, it's going to give you stuff for the entire cluster. Um, and when we filter down to just our namespace here for our app, we see we're doing really poorly. We have an F. Uh, <laughs> that's not a great score. Uh, so let's take a look at the different findings. Um, so we have, like I said, we have different deployments for the UI, the database, the app server, uh, and Redis. And so let's just focus for now on the UI um, because that would be our you know, front-facing portion uh, and I see we have some dangerous things that are enabled that are um, going on here, and we have some warning things. So the top one here, I'm going to just tackle that first. So let's take a look at what that means. So it says privilege, says privilege escalation should not be allowed. If we click on the question mark here, I'm going to get a um, link to our docs where we see uh, privilege, privilege escalation allowed, danger, security context, that allow privilege escalation is true. So that is the default setting. So if we go into our um, our YAML that we use to deploy the app, which I have here in this folder, we can take a look at the uh, UI YAML file and we see we have just a bare bones deployment here. I mean, just the bare minimum we need to get this uh, running. And um, I can make things a little bit bigger. Uh, yeah, thank I see you. the question there. Yeah, no problem. Let me, I'm just going to let this take over for a moment. I'll have to switch back and forth, but uh, that's all right. So we, we know we need to set security context dot privilege, allow privilege escalation to false. Uh, and really what we should do is have another link back to the Kubernetes docs. But uh, maybe I don't know what this means. Uh, maybe I'm unclear on this. So I'm going to look for the docs. And we're going to find the Kubernetes documentation on configuring a security context. I'll make this a little bit bigger too. Uh, and I tend to just kind of scroll through until I find the YAML I'm looking for. This is probably looking, hey, look at that. Allow privilege escalation. So this is going to prevent anything inside of our pod from, or inside of our container specifically, because this is the container security context, from uh, escalating its own privileges. So let's add that to our YAML file here. So we've got our deployment spec container security context allow privilege escalation false. And I'm gonna fix my YAML because I just broke it here. It's um, an entitled the wrong place. Let's put it here instead. There we go. All right, so we've got our container security context allow privilege escalation false. I'm gonna save this and then 
I'm going to apply this to uh, the cluster. And hopefully we then go into our Polaris dashboard and we can refresh this and take a look at our UI. And we see that our red X there has gone away and we've just improved our security posture a little bit uh, by fixing some of the default configuration in that app. So I'm gonna keep going with a couple of these. Um, if we look, we'll probably see that on all of these. So I'm gonna uh, just take a quick look at my YAML here and I'm just gonna apply that to all of them. So my goal today is I'd love to get a higher score in our, um, in our Polaris dashboard for this next place. So we started by uh, installing uh, Polaris just from Helm. Uh, we saw some issues, we fixed an issue and we immediately saw the the updated results. So Polaris is constantly watching for uh, changes in the Kubernetes uh, API and uh, always, always uh, up to date, right? That is correct. That so is it's, it's basically like an operator that, uh, Kubernetes operator that enforces these uh, security configurations. Is that an accurate way to put it? That is correct. So um, initially what it does is it scans. Um, so Polaris also has um, a, uh, an admission webhook that you can install as well to enforce these uh, on applied to the cluster. And then it also has um, the ability to uh, add custom checks as well. So we have all these built-in checks that we see here, but we are also able to add additional checks. How does one add a, so I don't want to interrupt your flow, but if you could just uh, say in a few words, like what's the uh, the language where I can specify things? Yeah, on my own. Uh, let's see. I actually haven't written a custom check in a little while, so let me go to here. And we can go to the Polaris documentation at uh, polaris.docs.fairwinds.com and go to the custom checks area. Um, and we essentially write them uh, in YAML here, but I believe we're using we're using JSON schema under the hood to write those mm -hmm. checks. Cool. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. No problem. All right. So we've got our security context. Uh, we have no. We are no longer allowing privilege escalation. Hopefully, everywhere. We've got rid of all of our dangerous checks. We just went from an F to a D minus. That's great, I suppose. Ds get degrees, I believe, was the saying when I was in college. And um, <laughs> so we can see that our um, security score actually has gone up a little bit. So that's great. Um, so that's some of the security things that you'll see. If we keep looking, you'll probably, we may see some more. Um, not allowed to run as root is another common one. So that's also set in the security context, uh, but that's set at the pod level security context. So we probably want to disable that. In fact, uh, the CVE that was released last week, um, if you don't have the ability to run any containers as root would have um, not mitigated entirely, but uh, reduced the blast radius of that CVE that, that we, uh, all had to deal with last week. So um, we can go ahead and add that in as well. And that's in the, where's the root? Oh, we need the run as user, run as group for the pod. That's right. So we're gonna modify the pod level security context. So in the pod spec, not underneath containers, we're going to add in our security context. And this one's a little more tricky uh, to modify because you can just stop running as root, but some containers, depending on how you've built your container, doesn't necessarily always play nicely. So we're gonna try this and see if it works. For the UI, I'm not horribly worried about it. The uh, database container in the Redis server might have a little bit more problems with that. All right. First things first, let's make sure our app's still running. Looks like we've refreshed. 
our database restarted and took all of its data with it. So our number of total votes is way down. Feel free to throw some load at this thing while we're uh, on here. Um, see if you can get the one of these to win. We've got yelp.kepler.hillghost.com uh, is the URL. And it's HTTP only. I wasn't able to get uh, TLS to be working with this particular app uh, while I was prepping for it. So let's go back to our dashboard, take a quick look at our UI. And see, all right. So we've dropped our uh, ability to run as root. Um, notice that check has gone green for us, so that's great. Um, let's see, what time are we at? 10, 15. So I'm going to do one more of these before I jump into the uh, efficiency side of things. So let's do one more security one, and let's do capabilities. This is an interesting one. Um, so again, insecure capabilities, this will link specifically into um, our, our internal list of insecure capabilities. Um, these are the uh, Linux kernel capabilities that your container has. Uh, these are also covered in the documentation here. Um, capabilities, oh, that's not the link I wanted, sorry. Let's keep going. Capabilities, there we go. All right, so, so what we want is the, in the pod, in the container level security context for each container that we're running, we have a list of capabilities that we can use. Uh, in theory, for our, UI container specifically, I don't think we'll need any. I haven't looked too deeply into this app, but we have the ability to add capabilities, but primarily what we want is the ability to, let's take a look at this again. Does it show the drop here? It doesn't. I believe we can do the same list here. We can drop all, and then we can add the ones we want. But let's try dropping all of them. Apply that. Assuming I got my ML correct, we did. And we'll take a look at our pods. And we have a crash loop back off. Not super surprised there. So capability is kind of like changing your user and your group that you're running as, depending on how your container is built and what it requires to do. You probably need some level of uh, capabilities. Here. So probably, my guess is we're going to need uh, something related to networking so that we can actually run whatever it is we're running here. So let's take a look. Logs. Yep. All right. Ah, we're running an Nginx container. I see. So um, the Yelb UI container is obviously built on an Nginx container and then serving up some files out of that. And Nginx is going to need some of those capabilities to run. So let's take a look. And we're going to add. Um, actually, I haven't done this in a little while. So I'm going to, let's take a look, let's close these and we'll take a look at the list of capabilities. I'm fairly certain we're going, well, let's just guess here. I need net, let's try net admin. Feel free to throw into the questions if you know exactly what capabilities Nginx needs but uh, that doesn't work, we can move on from that. So you, it's, um, you know, I like to run through this just kind of from a super clean perspective here because say I'm an ops person working on a team with developers that built a container and I need to help, you know, change the security configuration here. There are some things that are easy that are low hanging fruit. And then there's a lot of things that are more complex to change and more complex to update. And Polaris does a great job of alerting you to potential issues there. Um, but it still takes some effort to get the to get these things working. 
Still crashing. Probably need. I think it sounds like uh, it's uh, related to the user change, maybe not the capabilities change. Do you think? I was actually just wondering that myself. So let's stop this. I think you might be right. Because it does say it's attempting to run user directive makes sense if it's running with super user privileges, which it's not. Again here. Now we're gonna get operation committed. It's trying to chone something. So I'm not gonna spend a horrible amount of time attempting to get this working. I just wanted to really show kind of the, the level of complexity that I can take to get some of these configurations locked down. Um, it's not just a matter of, you know, go set the thing, do the thing here, change your YAML. You really have to understand what's running inside your container, what capabilities it needs, and, um, and also build your container in such a way that it doesn't require, you know, root level access if you can. So let's put this back, get this running again. Um, so that's that's really a, a decent uh, overview of some of the security checks we have. Um, there's a, probably additional ones I haven't talked about, but those are really the, the it, they should be the most straightforward to get configured with your various uh, applications. All right, so let's just make sure we've got everything running here. That's up correctly still. That looks much better. All right, Give this a little refresh. All right, and unfortunately though, if we refresh this page, we're gonna see we've uh, we've got our privilege escalation back because I commented that back out. So um, let's talk about some of the reliability stuff next because this is actually really one of my favorite areas to to jump into is reliability and efficiency. So we'll see a couple of issues here specifically around and this is still really small. I apologize for that. Um, for memory limits, CPU limits, CPU requests, uh, memory requests, and liveness and readiness probes. Uh, and these things, and, and again, I'll link out to the documentation if you click on the, the question mark here, but um, these things, the liveness and readiness probes, the CPU requests, the memory requests are really kind of the bare minimum for good reliability inside your Kubernetes cluster, especially if you're running multiple apps that need to uh, use different amounts of resources and things like that. So. Um, this is really where Goldilocks comes into play. So CPU and memory requests are great. We can say set them, but the question is then, okay, what do I set them to? Uh, you know, you can maybe, you know, you can profile your app. You can run it for a little while. I could go in here and kind of get an idea of how much CPU memory is my application using, is each piece of my application using right at this moment. Maybe I have some sort of monitoring hooked up and I can go look at historical graphs, but it's really kind of a frustrating, it can be a frustrating experience, especially across many apps, trying to go in and uh, figure out what do I set these to? And so we set out um, a long while ago to try and make this at least a little bit easier. Just move the needle a little bit, give people a tool that would make it uh, possible to set those memory requests and limits. In, a, in an easier way. And so what, what that resulted in was a project that we have called Goldilocks. Um, and all these projects are on GitHub in our Fairwinds org. Um, but uh, Goldilocks is a controller that uh, manages vertical pod autoscaler objects in recommendation mode, and then aggregates the uh, recommendations from those vertical pod autoscaler objects into a dashboard. And so the way this works is uh, we install Goldilocks in our cluster. Um, so we're going to, we would do the Helm, the same type of Helm install um, that we would have for Polaris. So we'd install Goldilocks in the Goldilocks namespace um, from the Fairwinds stable repository um, and create namespace. I'm not going to run this. I already have it. Um, if we take a look in the Goldilocks 
namespace. Uh, we have two components as a controller and a dashboard. One of the prerequisites of installing Goldilocks is that we also have the vertical pod auto scaler installed. Um, so if we look in our VPA namespace, I've already installed the vertical pod auto scaler. We have a chart for that. It can be installed as a subchart of Goldilocks. But essentially, we only, I, I really only need the recommender portion. I'm not going to run uh, vertical pod auto scaler in the uh, automatic mode where it changes your request and limits. I'm just going to run it in recommendation mode. And then the last thing we have to do um, is label our namespaces. So if we take a look at our namespace, our app namespace Yelp, we have this uh, label goldilocks.fairwinds.com slash enabled equals true. And what this does is it goes and creates a vertical pod auto scaler object for all of the deployments in our namespace here. So we, we see we have, these have been here for a few days. I built this a few days ago. Um, so they've been kind of collecting information over that time. So vertical pod auto scaler will watch the resource usage of your, your pods, your each container in your pod uh, and create a recommendation. So if we look at the, say for the UI, we look at the VPA object. Um, we see that in the status block, there's a set of recommendations. Uh, there's a lower bound, a target, an uncapped target, and an upper bound. Uh, currently, these look uh, all the same because they're using the minimum of what the vertical pod auto scaler uh, is set to. It has a, a minimum target. But uh, over time, if we had load on our application, we would see these numbers start to change. And so we can take a look at the Goldilocks dashboard um, and we can see those recommendations across all of our deployments, across all of our containers aggregated in a nice dashboard. So let me pull that up. Oh, all right. I'm going to pull up the Goldilocks dashboard. I put forwarded to it. Um, we can list all of our namespaces. We see all of them that are um, labeled here and have VPA objects in them. So we saw that the Yelp namespace had that label on it. I'm going to click into this namespace and I'm going to see this is a little bit too big, maybe. Um, I'm going to see the various deployments within there, within that namespace, and then each under uh, within that deployment. So if we had multiple containers, we'd see those here. And we see Goldilocks is giving us the same uh, issue that uh, Polaris was, which is that our resource limits aren't set. Uh, and it's going to give us a recommendation on how to set those. And so if we install Goldilocks alongside of our um, applications, we can. Um, get some recommendations over time on how to set those. The other nice thing, you can hook VPA, uh, the vertical pod autoscaler up to Prometheus to get some more, um, to get some more historical data incorporated into your uh, recommendations. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply the um, recommendations that Goldilocks is making. To my UI container. All right. Taking a look at the questions here. Is there anything? And we can take a look. Oh. Let's we'll set up our port forward with yeah. yeah. All right. That's Redis we applied to the UI. So now we're going to see that uh, Goldilocks is seeing that we have our uh, 
uh, resource requests and limits set to exactly what it, what it recommends. So I'm going to talk a little bit about QoS now. Uh, if you're not familiar with the quality of service class, it is when uh, your it's the configuration of the difference between your limit and your request. So if your limits and requests are equal, it's in what's called the guaranteed QoS class because you're guaranteeing that amount of resources to your uh, container. So uh, we, we show both burstable and guaranteed. Burstable is when you have requests that are lower than your limits so that your, your uh, workload can burst up to the limit. Um, and those are actually defined down here and link out to the Kubernetes documentation where we talk about it. But uh, we use the uh, lower bound and upper bound to build the burstable QoS recommendation. And then we use the, uh, the target from the VPA recommendation for both the request and the limit for the guaranteed QoS class. Um, so what I'd like to do is rerun my loop here, but I think I lost the count of that. I could generate some more load on this. So let me grab the code for that real fast. I'm not a JavaScript expert, so I asked one of our lovely app developers to give me this. Are there any questions that I can answer for people? So there was one question that I maybe try to generalize um, about Polaris, I think specifically, I'm not sure how it applies to gridlock, whether it follows some uh, kind of standard um, for the specific set of rules that you chose to uh, enforce there, or maybe to even generalize it further, how do you choose which rules get into Polaris, uh, which tests and how do you update them? Or does it relate to any kind of compliance or standard? A great question. Um, so this, the current set of checks that are built into Polaris are not built on any particular standard. They're really kind of a collection of things that we've seen as common best practices over the years. Um, so yep. we don't currently have anything that maps specifically to standards. We are talking about what we can do in that area. We just achieved our SOC 2 certification, so we're working on things to work with standards like that. Um, the other thing that we can do is in, in our in our commercial product, we started using QBench, which will give you the SIS benchmark, um, which is a nice thing to do. Uh, and then there's definitely a potential for building custom checks that would align with a, uh, a standard like that. But currently, it's just best practices that we've developed over time. Okay. Another kind of random question about uh, which terminal uh, you use, but uh, <laughs> uh, I use it's called Alacrity. Um, it's a uh, Rust terminal emulator. Um, cool. So yeah, it's out there. It's open source. So uh, I'm trying to get some load running on these different pods so that we can see different recommendations in Goldilocks. Uh, the other thing that we can do is we can uh, kind of tweak these a little bit to see, you know, say we maybe, say we, we built our container and we've got just these, you know, huge recommendations. Uh, I'm not going to go that high because I'm not sure how big these nodes are, but, you know, the original recommendation was much lower than this. Let's take a look. Goldilocks will not only tell you if you haven't set your, your requests and limits, um, it will also tell you if right? it will tell you if you have over provisioned your uh, requests and limits as well. So we can go back here and take a look at the dashboard and see that hey, we've we've over provisioned these. Maybe maybe we're using uh, maybe we allocated too many resources. Maybe we have an opportunity to save a little bit of money here and reduce the number of uh, nodes that we're. Um, so, um, the other thing I want to look at is the DB because it looks like it was under some load. And we also don't have them set here. I'm going to go ahead and set them for the database as well. So 
sorry, button in the right order. Where am I left? So that nice copy paste there makes it relatively easy if we want to put these everywhere. All right, I did DB Redis. Let's do app server. All right. Nice feature idea, add a button that applies recommended. <laughs> that would be cool. Uh, yeah. Although uh, in an infrastructure as code world, not my favorite solution. Um, but uh, uh, one ideal, uh, one thing that we've been talking about doing actually is adding the ability to do uh, you know, kind of depend about style pull requests. So you have yeah. issues in your Polaris and uh, it goes and creates uh, a pull request on your infrastructure's code or your Helm chart or you know whatever you have to apply these settings, which that would be super cool. Um, but our issues are open on all these open source projects, so feel free to go make that request there, and we'll see what we can do. All right, let's go refresh our dashboard here. See what we've got. Great, great, green, green, green. Oh, well. I changed it to lower than what they recommend. So let's just get it all green because green's good color. So that's Goldilocks. Let's hoping to generate a little bit more load on this. That's all right. They're still healthy. We are, and let's do every 10 milliseconds. Let's see how much we can click on this thing and how fast. Effective load generation is one of the most difficult things. All right. And the other nice thing, if we refresh our Polaris dashboard here, because we've set our resource requests and limits on all of our pods, we're going to jump from a D minus to a C plus. Hooray. Good for us. Yeah. All right. And I notice our efficiency score just went from zero, what it was before, up to 100%, because really the, the number one thing about efficiency is getting your resource requests and limits set properly. Um, and uh, if you've watched any of the stuff that I've done recently or you talked to me, uh, you probably know that I tend to harp on that a lot. Uh, it's one of the things that I just uh, jump back to frequently, but I, I have noticed over running uh, clusters for so many different clients that so many problems can be solved by really knowing uh, your resource requests and limits and then setting those properly and you utilizing the horizontal pod autoscaler along with your cluster autoscaling effectively. Just those few things right there can increase the stability of your Kubernetes deployments considerably. So we've done security, we've done efficiency. Let's talk about reliability. Um, that's a security one, that's a security one. Let's talk about liveness and readiness probes. 
so right now, uh, you may have noticed that in my YAML files here, I have no liveness and readiness probes whatsoever. Uh, liveness and readiness probes are super important to reliability because they allow you, uh, they essentially allow you to not route traffic when your app's not ready and also allows your app to be, uh, your pod to be terminated and brought back up when it's doing things that it shouldn't. So uh, I don't know if you noticed, but whenever I restart the pods, I get a bunch of errors in the console here. I think they're further up. This is a, a different error here. Um, but uh, that's because we're still routing traffic to a pod that's shutting down because the readiness probe yeah. hasn't, uh, there is no readiness probe configured. So traffic is always being routed to my pod. Um, so if we take a look at the Polaris check where it says liveness probe should be configured, uh, I'm going to hit the question mark here again. It's going to take me to readiness probe missing, liveness probe missing. Should probably link out to the docs here. So maybe I'll make a pull request for that later. But we can search the Kubernetes documentation for liveness probes. And we've got a nice document here on configuring liveness, readiness, and startup probes. Uh, and we can let's find one. Let's find an example that's an HTTP because we're running an HTTP server here. So in our container, we want to configure a liveness probe. And do this, and then we'll have to modify it a little bit for this application. We're in the UI. We know it's listening on port 8080, or sorry, port 80, due to the container port here. Uh, we probably don't have a health path that I'm aware of, and we don't need to send any custom headers. So there's our liveness probe. It's just going to be an HTTP get on port 80. If we get a 200 back, it's going to pass. If we don't get a 200 back, it's not going to pass. Fairly straightforward. Uh, and then we can, I think readiness probe, too much copy paste today. All right. Try that out. So we'll go back to our canines and we'll get pots. And we'll see we have creating. So now it's running, but we're not routing traffic just yet because the liveness probe has or the readiness probe hasn't started. And then the readiness probe starts. We have the ready pod, and now we're ready to terminate the old one. So hopefully we've handed over, we've had time for any connections to move to the new ready pod once it was actually ready to start accepting connections. And we'll go back to Polaris. Hey, look at that. We're getting a B now. Good times, good times. <laughs> we'll do the same for our, let me copy this. Linus and Rennes probe. Let's do the same for our app server. I'll we'll have to change the port here because we're listening on a different port. Apply that YAML. And we'll watch our pods here. Maybe. Sure, let's. There we go. Waiting for it to become ready. It's possible that this app doesn't respond on root, and so we may have to change our probe slightly. Rebuild system. All right. Let's see. And get back into it. Take a look. Awesome. 
Hans is unhappy with me. Oh, 137, that was um killed. Ah, so we don't spawn directly on that port. So our liveness and readiness probe on that port is not going to work. Another one of those things and another good example that building this stuff into your application from the beginning is much easier than trying to add it to an application that you aren't super familiar with up front. To answer the top question there, Goldilocks does not provide any security-related recommendations. That is entirely up to Polaris. Uh, and then another good question there that I didn't cover that I think is really worth covering is um, exceptions for exemptions for Polaris. Uh, so can you, the question is, is it possible to configure in Polaris to disable security context run as root for some pods? Uh, so essentially we want to say, you know, this pod is supposed to run as root or this pod has to run at root, run as root. Uh, we can uh, add exemptions. So um, you can exempt uh, an entire deployment from uh, all checks. Um, but you can also exempt from specific checks. So if we want to, for example, annotate our, um, well, let's let's do the UI, or actually the app server deployment. We weren't able to configure our liveness and readiness probe. Perhaps there's some reason we want that to be the case. Um, we'll add a annotation to our app server deployment to, to exempt it from that check. So um, let's annotations, polaris.fairwinds.com slash um, it is go to the app server, liveness probe. Is liveness probe missing? So we will do that. And let's also do readiness probe. Wrong. Oh, this needs to be a string. So the one is curious, gets all mad at me. There we go. All right, so we gotta take a look at our dashboard again. Oh, I lost my port forward. we could put this behind an ingress, maybe front it with some OAuth using a proxy. Um, but if we take a look at our app server, we see that the liveness probe, uh, liveness probe still here. But readiness is not, did I misspell something? That can happen. Perhaps a bug. Hmm. <laughs> I may have discovered a bug live on 
CNC have live stream today. I'll have to take a look at that later. But we did drop the readiness probe uh, issue from the list. So that is how you would do exemptions. Obviously, if we wanted our score to go straight to an A+, we could just turn on all the exemptions and uh, we'd get that, which comes to the top question there, which is how is the score calculated? Um, the I believe, we may have changed this recently, but the, the score is essentially a percentage of uh, passing checks to, miss, to failing checks. Uh, so that's how we get the 81%, and then we just do a, a typical letter grade score based on that percentage. All right. And I have a question there about uh, any way to figure some sort of a notification. That is a good question. I don't remember if we have that in the open source. Um, so we, we definitely have that in our SaaS product. We've used the data from Polaris and send that to our SaaS product, and we can do notifications in there. I don't think we do notifications from the open source project. All right. Uh, you can run, so an additional feature of Polaris um, is there is a CLI and you can run it in CI CD as well if you want. Um, so if we had our uh, YAML files here, we could run the Polaris uh, CLI and we could run a Polaris audit. Uh, I believe by default, it tries to connect to your cluster, um, but we can um, Polaris audit dash dash audit path and we can audit our yaml in place right here so if you wanted to put a ci cd check in place use polaris to audit it and then you know write some automation to send a notification based on that it would be relatively straightforward if we just output this nice json object here that you can parse and see all of the different failing checks in the different namespaces uh and and what's going on with them so we see like my ingress, as I mentioned earlier, doesn't have TLS configured. We would see this as um, a result in our JSON object. So it would be relatively straightforward to uh, build a, uh, a pipeline notification for that using the CLI. Cool. That's cool. I think now would be a good time to start uh, summarizing as we near the end. Yeah, yeah that would be great. Uh, so. You know, a quick summary of what I did today is uh, we took an app just deployed with some very basic YAML files uh, with almost no uh, overrides for the defaults in Kubernetes. And we used Polaris to identify some of the security issues with those default deployment YAMLs. Uh, and then we used the recommendations from Polaris to fix some of those security settings. So not running as root, uh, not allowing privilege escalation, looking at... Um, kernel capabilities, uh, and then we used Goldilocks to take a look at resource recommendations to set our resource limits and our resource uh, requests for the deployment that we uh, had deployed to the cluster for that application in order to work on the efficiency of it. And we also talked a little bit about reliability with liveness probes and readiness probes and how Polaris can identify where those are missing in your applications as well. Yeah, and, and where can people go to uh, get started or uh, ask questions uh, after this show? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, we have uh, our GitHub repositories for all of our open source are at our GitHub uh, organization, Fairwinds Ops, and then uh, slash Polaris or slash Goldilocks. Uh, feel free to file an issue or take a look at, at PRs on any of those. And in addition to that, we also, if you go to any of our open source repos, there's a link to our community Slack. Uh, you can click on that and get an invite to join our community Slack and talk about these projects as a channel for each one of our open source projects. Uh, and then we also have an open source user group that we've been working on, on building recently uh, that meets every so often. Uh, and there's also a link to do that there as well. Uh, so feel free to reach out through any of those mediums uh, and uh, I'm also in the Kubernetes Slack, so if you want to hit me up there, I'm always available there as well. All right, great. Uh, so uh, with that, Andy, thank you uh, so much. This was a really great introduction Thanks to Polaris me. and great logs. Um, yeah, and uh, everyone else, thank you as well for joining. Uh, and see you next Wednesday on Cloud Native Live.
Thank you. Thank you.